Well, it's good to have you tonight. It turned out to be a, a beautiful day. And uh, somebody had asked me that I pray it rained today for them. And I prayed, but it didn't start raining until after Sunday morning service. So my prayers didn't go as far. Did it work? Did it work for you? Good. Praise the Lord. So I prayed and God answered prayer. And whatever you needed, it took care of it. Praise the Lord. Okay. How many is happy that you love the Lord and that you know the Lord? Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles tonight, you'll remember probably most of you that come on Sunday nights. I think it was a Sunday night that I preached. Uh, on uh, preached on the subject of the Lord knows the way through the wilderness. Does anybody remember me preaching on that? It's only been maybe a, a couple, two or three months ago when I preached on that. Well, tonight I'm going to preach on the wilderness again, but it's not going to be the same type of message that I preached on before. I'd like to bring a couple different aspects to that subject, if I may. Thank you. Oh, I lost a piece of paper. First of all, I got a few things I want to share with you while you turn with me to the book of uh, Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16. And we're going to read a few verses there as our main text. In fact, let me do that. And then I got a couple illustrations I wanted to, to share with you. Let's read. I'm reading from the King James Version tonight. Chapter 16 of Exodus beginning with verse 1. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. So actually they'd only been in the wilderness for a, a month and a half. This is all the longer they had been wandering after they crossed the Red Sea. One and a half months. It's the 15th of the second month. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses. It didn't take them long to start. It. They started almost immediately. Well, first of all, before we go any further, you know, if, if Israel would have listened to God, here they are, one, they are a month and a half into the desert. Six weeks. If they would have listened to God, they would have crossed the desert and been into the promised land in three and a half months. That's all longer it would have taken. They'd have crossed, went into the promised land, and everything would have been what God promised them that it would be. But because they began to murmur and complain and and cause God to get a little bit upset with them. God said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna let you swim in this for a while. And uh, see how you make it. Isn't that what God did? That's exactly what he did. And so he turned them from the route I believe that he intended for them to go and took them roundabout journeys. In fact, most of the journey that they went on was almost in a circle. They, they just never got out of that wilderness, that desert. Let's go on. The whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron, verse 2, in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said of them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For he had brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. Now there's, there's what I just said. There's a key verse that you ought to mark down. Because people say today that, that God doesn't prove people. But He does prove people. That all God does is bless people. I'm here to tell you that God puts us through hard places to test our faith. How many believe that? To see what we're made of. To see whether we're going to follow Him or whether we're not going to follow Him. 
And uh, God does it all the time. He does it to me. He does it all the time. No sooner do I get through one hardship, and, and then I think things are going to cool off and, and get okay, and something else pops up, and i got to remember, God, you're doing something to me again. You know, I walk in the office on Monday mornings, and I tell Joyce, I do it just for kidding, and to make her laugh, I say, I believe God hates me. You know, I know he doesn't, but I'll say that to Joyce. I say, you know, Joyce, I believe God hates you. So, oh, Pastor, God doesn't hate you. I said, I know he doesn't. I said, he's trying me. He's trying me to see what I'm made of, to see if I'm going to stick, if I'm going to be what I say I am. That's so important. Then said the Lord unto Moses, verse 4, Behold, I will rain bread, verse 5, And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel, At even, then you shall know that I am the Lord that brought you out from the land of Egypt. And in the morning, then you shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that murmur, that ye murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening the flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to be full. The Lord heareth your murmurings, which you murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but they are against the Lord. And Moses spake unto Aaron, and saying unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. And it came to pass as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud that was by, that was by day. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that even the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning the dew lay around about the host. And when the dew that lay was going up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as a hoarfrost, on the ground with a gray or a silver frost like your gray hair. It's called in the Bible, uh, uh, use that word for, right? that's what they used for gray and for silver color. Uh, it was the color of, of frost, of silver on the ground. Heavenly Father, bless your word, make it real to us tonight. And, and Lord, the few of us that are here tonight, God, somebody evidently needs this. And Lord, I hope that our hearts will be open, our minds will be open to receive. I know there's a, a lot of tired people here. And so God, I pray, God, that you'll just give them refreshment from your word. Your word is a, a, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. God, we're so thankful for the word of God. And so tonight, Lord, use me as your channel. And may your word just ignite itself in our hearts. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen and amen. Roy McLean tells of a beggar who stopped a lawyer on the street of a large southern city and asked him for a quarter. Taking a long, hard look into the man's unshaven face, the attorney asked, uh, Don't I know you from somewhere? You should, came the reply. I am your former classmate in college. Remember second floor, old main hall? Why, Sam, of course I know you. Without further question, the lawyer wrote him a check for $1,000. Here, take this and get a new start. I don't care what's happened in the past, it's the future, future that counts. With that, he hurried on. And I'll just tell you the rest. So the man who was a street, who one ended up being a lawyer from college, the other one ended up being a, a street bum. Uh, the street bum uh, took the $1,000 check and went to the bank and went to open the door. He looked through the window and saw that everybody in there was dressed in nice suits and, and the women were dressed in nice dresses and, and he said to himself, I can't take this check in there and get it cashed. They'll think that I forged it. What bum walks around with a thousand dollar check? So he just left and never cashed it. And he went and he slept on the, on the uh, ground that night and covered himself up with newspapers. And when he got up the next morning, he was walking down the, the street in the main part of the city. Here comes that lawyer again. And so the lawyer said, uh, what did you do with the money I gave you, Sam? He said, did you drink it up? Did you gamble it? He said, what did you do with it? He says, 
I still have the check. He said, what do you have the check for? I told you to cash it. The man said, I knew if I walked in that bank and they saw the way I look, they would have thought for sure I forged that check and they'd have never cashed it for me. And the lawyer looked at him and he says, it doesn't matter how you look. It doesn't matter how dirty you are or what mess you've come out of. The important thing is that my signature is on that check. And because my signature is on that check, you can take it anywhere and they will cash it for you. Now, what the message there is that God sometimes allows us to go through difficult, difficult things. But remember, when the Bible says when we become a Christian, that he puts a seal on us by the Holy Spirit. How many believes that? Every Christian is sealed by the Holy Spirit. And because every Christian is sealed by the Holy Spirit, we are set apart so that we are known by all Christendom and God makes sure that wherever we go or whatever we do, God will provide some way for us to be able to do what we need to do. I've seen it happen hundreds of times when they didn't think you could make it. God always helped us and we made it. It's always happened. It always will happen for the believer. Things are going to get tight. Things are going to get hard in these last days. Things don't just come together. They don't fall into your lap. You've got to work for them. You've got to believe for them. And sometimes everything you work for is taken away from you. Just like that. And you've got to start all over again. That's awful. There's people in this church that have had to do that. Who helps us in times like those? God does. Amen. Remember in the Bible where Jesus talked about the, the little birds, the sparrows? Let me read a little poem to you. I am only a little sparrow, a bird of low degree. My life is a little value, but the dear Lord cares for me. He gave me a coat of feathers, it is very plain, I know, with never a speck of crimson, for it is not made for show. But it keeps me warm in winter and it shields me from the rain. When it bordered, uh, where it bordered with gold and purple, perhaps it would make me vain. I have no barn or storehouse. I never sow or reap. God gives me a sparrow's portion, but never a seed to keep. May my meat is sometimes, is sometimes scanty. Close, close hitting makes it sweet. I have always enough to keep me, and life is more than meat. I know there's many sparrows all over the world that are found, but our Heavenly Father knoweth when one of us falls to the ground. Though small we are never forgotten, though weak we are never afraid, for we know that the dear Lord keepeth the lives of the creatures he made. I fly through the thickest forest, I lay on the many spray, I have no chart or compass. But let me tell you something, as a sparrow, I never lose my way. Amen? I never lose my way. Amen. Well, so much, so much for that stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, let's face it, you can't get what you're, where you're going. You can't get where you're going without going through the world. I don't care who it is. I've never met a Christian yet that's never had a hard time. And if I did meet a Christian that never had a hard time, I always encourage them by saying, yours is coming. <laughs> Not encouragement, but uh, I always told him, I said, you better enjoy it while you can, because bad times are on their way. And, and you're bound, if you live long enough, you're bound to go through it. Everybody does. Everybody's need to do it. And God, I believe, intends for everybody to do it. It will be right in your path, that wilderness. It's made to stay put. The wilderness doesn't move. You're the one who moves. Always remember that. The wilderness does not move. You're the one that moves. And so it's up to God to lead us and to transport us and to help us so that we can make it through those difficult times. The only way for you and I is through it. Right through it. You can't get around it. There's no way to get around it. And if you're facing some difficulties this evening, and for some reason, God laid this message on my heart. I went through three of them before I finally settled on this one. If, if this is the case tonight, then remember, the wilderness isn't going to move for you. And God is not going to move the wilderness out of your way. Did you hear that? 
He's not going to move the wilderness out of your way. You've got to go through it. Or you can lay down and die. One or the other. Let me give you just a couple things tonight to share with you quickly. Number one, what will you see as you travel through the wilderness? Now, in the last uh, message I gave on the wilderness, I preached on the Lord knows the way through the wilderness, and we sang that chorus, and I may sing it at the end tonight. I'm not sure, but the Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All we have to do is follow. That's true. But God began to deal with me and said, well, if you're going into the wilderness, Let's face some facts. What are you going to face? And I want to share with you a few things biblically tonight. First of all, you're going to face desolation. Without a doubt, you're going to face desolation. In, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 22, and verse 6, it says, For thus saith the Lord unto the king's house of Judah, Thou art give Gilead unto me, and the head of Lebanon. Yet surely I will make thee a wilderness and cities which are not inhabited. You know, folks, uh, that's an awful thing to not have any place to rest, to not have anybody to talk to. And I don't know whether you're here tonight, but everybody goes through it when you get lonely, melancholy. You know, Sol uh, King Solomon was the richest man. You know that. He, he was married to more women than I can count. Uh, he had more money than any of us could ever conceive to have. He had more problems, it seems like, as rich as he was, as a, great a peacemaker as he was. All through Solomon's leadership, Israel never went to war. They had perfect peace in the country of Israel, all during Solomon's reign. But Solomon had personal problems. He had big personal problems. And one of those problems was that he just felt alone. He felt desolate. And he starts out the book of Ecclesiastes in which he wrote. He says, what is worth living for? You go to chapter 3 and it says there's a, a, a day to be born and there's a day to die. And he goes on to tell there's a day to rip rocks apart from you. There's another day to gather those rocks back. And there's another day to lose. There's another day to gain. There's another day to mourn. There's another day to laugh. There's another day to be happy. There's another day to dance. There's another day to mourn deeply for that which you have lost. And I can go on and on and on and on. And he ends it. The whole chapter, the whole book. In fact, uh, I, I wasn't going to do this, but maybe it wouldn't hurt to do it. Go with me, if you will, and I'm going to hunt this for a second. Stay with me here. I got too many little papers in my Bible, and it takes me longer. The Book of Song of Solomon. Now I'm going to confuse you. Go, go with me to chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes. Chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes. I didn't have this in my notes, but I'd like to read it to you. Now he, he spends 12 chapters in telling how miserable he is. 12 whole chapters in the whole book of Ecclesiastes and said there's nothing to live for. There's nothing worth living for. All the aspirations I had are down the drain. I, I just will die. But after this, he comes to this conclusion. Verse 13 and verse 14 of chapter 12. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Listen to this. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Thank God I believe that, always did believe that Solomon came to himself. I believe that he finally realized that he needed God and that he needed to give God all his life. He was, I believe at one point in his life he must have been very close to being backslidden. 
or very melancholy. But he comes to the point to where he realized that God was his only source. I want you to remember that. Desolation is in this wilderness. Number two, there's wild creatures. Now, I'll explain that here in a moment. But turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8. The first part of, of verse 15. It says, Who led thee through all that great and terrible wilderness? Wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions. And I think I read that wrong. I put the emphasis in the wrong way on that scripture. Let me go back to verse 13 so I can read it right. And when they, well, thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, verse 14, then thy heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Now let's continue. Who led thee from that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and were scorpions. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we don't, I'm not talking about real animals in our lives, but I'm talking about, I'm talking about creatures. I'm talking about demons. I'm talking about evil forces. You don't know half of what I deal with every week with individuals that come to my office and say, Pastor, I see little men running around my bed. There's a lot of Christians today don't know what it is to battle spiritually. To actually get into a place with God where you battle the principalities and the powers that be. I remember my mother used to tell me, she, she lived a horrible life. And, and uh, even when she, she was a young girl, she lived a horrible life. And uh, she had told me stories of how her dad used to chain her to a tree and beat her with a whip at the age of 14 because she came home sick. She, he made her go at 12 years old to the silk factory and work in the silk factory for 12 and 14 hours a day. And she did that all her life until she finally left home. And one time he chained her to a tree and beat her with a whip. You know, those things, a lot of people don't hear those things. But she had a horrible, horrible life. But she used to tell me when she found the Lord and how God filled her with the Holy Spirit. And she went to Greenland, same Bible school that passed her, passed her there. She went to that Bible school in Pennsylvania here and studied for the ministry. And for many years did minister. So, whenever she had an opportunity. And she told me one time, she said, you know, son, every time I had to preach, it seemed like every night I'd wake up in the middle of the night and the forces of hell would be in my bedroom. And I could see, as it were, evil forces walking around my bed. And I'd have to begin to plead the blood and ask God to cleanse my mind and cleanse my body. You see, see in the Bible it says that God took the Israelites through an awful wilderness. And this wilderness was filled with awful serpents and scorpions that could kill if they would sting them. And you know, the, the devil is out. If he can catch us in the wilderness, if we don't stay close to God and stay focused, let me tell you something. There's some of you tonight that are in the wilderness and you're not out of it yet. You've been in it for a while and you're right smack in the middle. You're not near the end yet. You can look back when it started, but you're not near the end and you don't know where the end is. There are scorpions all around you. And there are wild creatures all around you waiting to sting you. And to take you down. One individual told me three weeks ago, said, I've never lived such a horrible life in all my life. I've never lived in such a horrible life. Every night I go to bed, I'm told I'm going to This is a Christian. Every night I go to bed, I'm told And fear begins to grip my heart. George Trithiades told me, and he has loads of, of, of stories to tell us about miracles. 
of how he went to Africa for three weeks and those people who are, are steeped in demon worship came to those meetings by the horns and God healed them because their faith was simple. Let me tell you something. There's only one way out of the wilderness. You're not going to eat your way out of it. You're not going to write your way out of it. You're going to keep following Jesus Christ. You're going to keep focused on Him. If you don't stay focused on God, then, then, then these, these awful creatures, and I know I'm sounding a bit graphic tonight, and I hope nobody goes home tonight and has bad dreams. But you just bleed the blood on your, on your, it's, thank God if that's what it is, just a bad dream, you'll get over it. But I'll tell you something, folks. What I'm talking tonight, you won't hear in the pulpit very often. There are evil forces that are wanting to take the church down and wanting to church, take the church down family by family by family by family. And, and the devil will do anything he can to disrupt your flow of worshiping God. How many believe me? How many believe I'm saying the truth tonight? Now, you haven't heard that preached for a long, long time. And many of you have never experienced that, and thank God you have. I have. There's a while back that I preached, since we're on the radio, I, I preached on demons, on, on, uh, the, on fighting against demon power. How many remember me preaching that on a Sunday morning? And you know, folks, the Saturday night before, I literally had to get up and go out of my bedroom because the forces of hell were walking around my bed. So, so, uh, so many demons were walking around my bed that I went out of the room and put myself on the floor in the living room and cried out to God, God, I'm going to preach this no matter what. You say, oh, you're just going crazy, Pastor. Maybe that is, I don't know. But I'll tell you, it, it's in concordance with what the Word of God teaches. And I know this, if you want to get close to God, now listen to me closely. If you want to get close to God, that's a wonderful thing. And I hope everybody does. Because unless we get close to God, it's going to be hard to be ready for the rapture. But when you get close to God, the closer you get to God, the more you're going to battle with the enemy. And the more real the enemy is going to become. The more real he's going to become. So, in that, in that wilderness, are wild creatures. There's no water. You know, water speaks of refreshment. In the last part of Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 15, it says, uh, let me read the whole verse again so I can go right into the second part. Where, uh, who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and, and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of Flint. Water is always an example of refreshment. And you know, so many times in the wilderness, there was, it, was, it was hot in the daytime, and talk, the Bible even talks about frost on the ground in the wilderness for the people of Israel. So it got 120 degrees in the daytime, and it got down to 32 degrees at night. Can you imagine trying to live with no house to live in? Probably tents that they put up. And they move and they walk for 10 miles. That's about the limit. They, they carry all that paraphernalia and drag all that stuff for 10 miles. And then they have to put it all up and make camp. 1.8 million people put all that stuff up, including the tabernacle, put it all back up. And they'd stay there maybe a few days. Who knows how long God told them. Then they'd have to tear it all back down. And the only shelter they had was those tents. That was it. The wind blew. It was dry. It was hot in the daytime. And freezing, freezing cold at night. I was in Israel. Bill was with me. I saw Bill here. Bill Bennett and John Mason. And I'm not sure if anybody else. I remember Brother Forker, uh, Don Forker Jr., was with me that time. We went to Israel. I remember down in, we were down just five miles, about 20 miles maybe, off of, of the mountain out of Jerusalem. And it was 100 degrees. Remember that, guys? It was 100 degrees. We went up to Jerusalem and it was snowing. Now these people put up with that kind of stuff. I don't know how they made it. God had to help them. We all have virus. And I'm not being funny. Everybody
body of all of us would be sick with viruses if we had to live like that. But the Bible says that God kept his people. He put them through hard places, but he kept them. Thank God for that. Let me read just a portion to you. I did. I read it to you at the end uh, where the water got supplied, the refreshing for them. Uh, uh, there was great and terrible things in this wilderness. Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 19. All these scriptures are taken from the King James Version. And when we departed from Lord, we went through all that great and terrible wilderness. And I just don't know how to take the words to tell you how it is. Although we took a little bit of a trip. Uh, maybe Bill sometime could help me and remind me of what part of the desert we drove through. But I know that it was, there was nothing, was there, Bill? There was nothing. I mean, there was hardly any trees. There was just nothing but hot sun and, and, and cold in the night. And, and there wasn't a cloud in the sky. A man told me in Jerusalem, he said, we get rain seven days a year. That's it. Seven days a year we get rain. The rest of the time the sun is blazing hot. The skies are pure clear. And the wind is scorching with heat. At night they are freezing with cold. I don't think. Let me tell you something. When we're going through this desert, doesn't it get terrible sometimes? Doesn't it get, don't we get shaky sometimes? Don't we wonder if our whole future is coming up before us? If we're ever going to make it through there? It's so cold at night when we're alone. And it's so hot when we're fighting this thing. We wonder if we've got enough strength in our spiritual body to be able to fight the imps of hell to get through this thing. Let me tell you something. Israel did get to the promised land. It just took them 40 years. I've been preaching 41, going on 42. It took them just about as long as I've been preaching to get through there. 385 square miles is all the bigger that desert is. And it took them 40 years to get out of there. They were completely lost. You know, folks, there's no excuse in this day, and I say this with reverence. There's no excuse for anybody going through the wilderness today to not find their way. We've got the Word of God. We've got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We've got the power of God. We've got the blood of Jesus. There's no reason why we cannot find our way. Amen? But I'll tell you, the longer we fail to get concentrated, focused, on Jesus, the longer we're going to be in that desert where terrible and great things happen. So keep it in mind, page two, how about loneliness? In this desert, the Bible says it was lonely. It was lonely. Turn with me to Psalm 107 which is a direct reference back to when the children of Israel were in, in this wilderness. Psalm 107, verses 4 and 5. And I'm probably reading too fast for you, but I'll give you a moment. Psalm 107, verses 4 and 5. And they wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way, and they found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their souls fainted in them. Let me read that just one more time to maybe get you a picture of what they were going through. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. What does that word solitary mean? It means lonely. In a lonely, destitute way. Have you ever felt you didn't have any friends? Everybody feels that way at times. I have no friends. Nobody understands me. Nobody. Nobody wants to understand me. Every time I try to talk to somebody, they pat me on the shoulder and say, I'll remember you, and they walk away. Nobody stays and tries to help me. It is so lonely going through this thing. Have you ever felt that way before? Sure, everybody does. That's the way this wilderness was. It was a lonely, 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 lonely place. But there's an answer to loneliness. There's an answer to melancholy. 
spirit of melancholy. The Holy Spirit. He's everywhere. And my Bible tells me Jesus through His Spirit will never leave us nor forsake us. I don't care where we go. He's with us there to help us and to take us through. So you know, folks, I don't take anything in the flesh that seriously. I take things seriously that I have to. But there's a lot of stuff that I just put in file 13. I don't let it bother me because, because if you did, it would take you away from God's presence. It would get your mind off of Jesus. And so when I hear all this stuff, I just say, Jesus, I put it under the blood. I put it under the blood because I don't want anything while I'm in this. You say, Pastor, I wish I could be like you. There's somebody in our church right now a couple weeks ago. She said to me, she said, Pastor, you never have any problems. I wish I, I, wish I could just live a week in your life. I said, Sister, I'll give you a week of it. I'll give you a week of it if you want to have it. There's nobody that doesn't go through problems. There's nobody. Sometimes we wonder how in the world they started. How in God's name they started. Boy, if we get one of them. Just when you think you need somebody, there's nobody there. You ever been there? Just when you think you need somebody, there's nobody there. Let me tell you something. And don't forget this. God does have somebody in your path. Stay true. Stay focused. And those people will be in your path when you need them. They always have, and they always will. Thank God for that. Number two, first of all, we shared with you, what will you see as you travel through that wilderness? Number two, as a child of God, what can you expect? What can you expect while you're there? Number one, you can expect God's provision. God's not going to send you through the wilderness and leave you. He doesn't do those kind of things. People say that. I have even Christian people that, and I know it's a big thing when we lose a loved one, but I have Christian people tell me, I guess God doesn't love me anymore. That's not true. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Tomorrow I'm preaching a funeral here, and I'm preaching on when the waters were, were stirred in the pool. And the man wanted to get into the water, and nobody would rule him in. And everybody else would run before him and get into the water and get healed. One day Jesus came by. There was somebody there at the right time. He was there year after year after year after year. And at the right time, Jesus walked by and said, what's your problem, sir? He said, I've been here all these times and nobody will help me. I, I'm, I'm an invalid. I can't get in that water. He said, you don't have to this time. He said, be healed, sir. And he got up and walked away and praised the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? You know, somebody will say, you're going to have to go through hell over there. But God says, you may not have to. Because I'm here. How many can say amen? amen? The law says, the world says, you're going to have to take that route. But the word says, and the Lord says, I may have another route for you to go. You follow me. You stay true to me. I will take you through. Are you with me? I hope. Very quiet. Deuteronomy chapter 2. He's our provision. And verse 7. Deuteronomy 2 7. For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all thy works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking. Did you hear that? He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness. I want to let that sink in and sink in. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness these 40 years. The Lord thy God hath been with thee. And listen to this. Israel, people in Mount Moore's Gospel Tabernacle, thou hast lacked nothing. Amen. Amen? Thou hast lacked nothing. Oh, I can remember back in the early years of preaching, and you can remember in the early years of your life, and maybe you're going through some of it now when things were skimpy and didn't have much. That old 53 Chevy, I told you enough about it. I wish I could just bring it in this room. I loved it. But it just got so bad that I couldn't run it no more. I tried rebuilding it. 
me and one of the teachers at Bible College, and we took it out under a big oak tree and tried to put a new, uh, tried to put new pistons in a six-cylinder Chevy, put new pistons and rings in it, and, and uh, it had uh, it had those old Babbitt bearings in it, not like those sleeve bearings. And if they got a little, got the bouncing around on the crankshaft, it wouldn't last long, and they'd start rattling and you had to get rid of them. And I, I fixed that thing, thought I did good. I forgot to put oil in the cylinders when I put it back together. And uh, I took it out there and put it on the battery. And <clears throat> I couldn't get it together. I took it, I didn't know nothing too much about it anyway. And I remember taking the spark plug out and taking a, this is not good to do. And I, I took a steel rod, stuck down in the hole where the spark plug goes, and tried to ram that piston down. So another guy came out and said, what are you doing? He said, get that rod out of that motor. He said, you're going to ruin it. I said, I can't get the thing to turn over. It's just as tight as a drum. He says, well, did you put any oil in the cylinders or anything before you put it back together? I said, well, I didn't know to do that. He says, you'll never start it. You'll never start it. So we took the pan off, unhooked the bearings, pulled the cylinders down, uh, pulled the pistons down, shot some oil up in there, put it back up in, hooked it back up to the drive shaft, put the pan back on, she painted right off. You see, folks, some things don't work very good, it's not oil. And if we don't have the Holy Ghost with us going through this wilderness, it's going to get cold and damp and hungry. We're going to get weak and we're going to get disgusted. And our tolerance level is going to be about that high, and we're not going to want to put up with anything. But if you keep your life oiled with the Holy Spirit, and everything is flowing right now, I don't care how bad things get, you'll just slide right through it. It'll be tough. It won't be easy. But you'll make it through. And God will give you the blessing. I pray for these young preachers and this young guy with us that's with us. I'm so happy to have him with us for the ride. You know, you're just getting started, son. That wilderness is right smack ahead of you. Isn't that good to be encouraging? <laughs> and we're going to be praying for you and doing all we can to help you. you know? But, uh, you know, I hope this message will last in your heart because you'll get through. You'll be going through. And God will help you because He called you and He set you apart. Amen. I heard somebody say something. Yeah. Yeah, how are you doing, buddy? I'm glad you're here. I got a brother on the back seat that has cancer. We're going to pray for him at this altar in a little bit. Okay? You stay right here until the altar call. You stay till the altar call and I'll get you up here. Okay? Okay. Good. You stay right there. Amen. All right. Secondly, not only does God provide as a child of God, what can I expect in the wilderness? But I can expect His guidance. Now, in our last message, we touched on this. Psalm 78, if you have your Bibles open, turn with me. Psalm 78, verse 52. But made his own people to go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. Let me read it again. Let me read it again. But made his own people to go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. Like a flock. Amen. I'm glad the Lord will be there to guide us, aren't you? Aren't you? I'm glad He'll be there to guide us. Praise the Lord. Something else you can look for in the wilderness. You can look for miracles. Oh, thank God. Amen. With all the bad stuff I've talked about, aren't you glad that God can do miracles in the middle of the wilderness? When everything is so bad, it doesn't look like it get any better. How many glad that God can do an instant miracle? And turn everything around. Well, that's wonderful. Psalm 78, the same chapter, back at verses 12 through 16. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the field of, of Zoe. He divided the sea and he caused them to pass through. He made the waters to stand as a heap. In the daytime also he led them with a cloud, and all the night with a light of fire. He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink. 
and out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run like rivers. Thank God for those miracles. And uh, notice Matthew chapter 15. I won't read it tonight, but I'll just start and then and you know the story so well, I won't have to read it. But Matthew chapter 15, beginning with verse 32. Then Jesus called his disciples and said unto him, I have compassion on the multitude, because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. Can you imagine? Jesus preached to these people for three days and three nights, and they had nothing to eat all three days and three nights. Nor did Jesus. But Jesus wasn't worried about himself. They were in the wilderness. I believe that. They were in a very desperate place. But they wanted to hear Jesus. When you go around the Sea of Galilee in Israel, it's very barren, very dry. And as they stood, when Jesus went about the Sea of Galilee and preached in, in uh, Galilee, uh, it was hot, just like I was talking about in the desert. Uh, many places, just as hot, except there was more trees and more shade in the country of Israel in many areas. And Jesus said, uh, do we have anything to eat? And the disciple says, uh, well, we just have a few fishes and a few loaves of bread. And Jesus said, get them. And as you know, he began to, he began to break the, the bread and the fishes and begin to hand it out. And, and in this case, it says there was 4,000 plus men and women, and, uh, plus women and children. And, and who knows how many people there were, but he says they fed them all and they had baskets left over because Jesus does miracles and provides for us. I want to close with this. Number three. First of all, what will you see as you travel through? We shared some pretty rough things there. Second, as a child of God, what do you expect? You can expect everything that God does. Now, what do I do? What do I do? Do you know something? I find that when people begin to pray for other people, God ministers to them. Have you ever seen that happen? When something's wrong with you, and you go up and lay hands on a fellow brother or sister, and you start praying for them, God ends up doing something for you, and you didn't even ask Him. But you were ministering to that other individual. I believe that God wants us to use our hands. That's my last point. Miracles by our hands give encouragement and help in the wilderness. If we keep ourselves busy, if we work for the Lord, if we do what we know we need to do, God will take our mind off our troubles and he'll, we'll see miracles happen to others around us. You know, it's one thing for one person to be miserable. But not everybody has to be miserable. And I believe while we're going through the, the wilderness, if we minister to one another, we can make it through. And it's not going to be quite as bad as what we thought it was going to be like. My twin brother, I'm going to close with this. My twin brother told me about when he was in, in the state of Washington preparing to go to Vietnam. And he said how they put him out in the swamps with the uh, water moccasins and just made him go right out in the swamps. And uh, he was on a special unit. And he said they had to go out and, and go through maneuvers and, and snakes everywhere, crocodiles everywhere. And he said they made them go through the harshest, the most harshest of training that they could possibly go through. And he said, Fred, he said, that was, a, that was the most horrible thing. He said, I didn't think the army was too bad. And he said, I didn't even think it was going to be too bad going to Vietnam. But he said, when they put me in that swamp in Washington, and he said, it was cold up there. It was only about 38 degrees. And he says, I got sick. And he said, as soon as I got well, they sent me right back. Put me right back in the water. I had to fight those snakes. I had to fight those crocodiles. And he said, I didn't think I was ever going to get out of that mess. And he said, uh, that's one time I prayed. I said, Lord, if you saved my life. He did. He prayed. He said, Lord, if you saved my life and help me to pass this so I can go on and do my duty for my country. He said, I'll forever be thankful to you. I asked him a few years ago, about four or five years ago, I was back down there again, me and my sons. And he came up while I was standing outside in front of the trailer. I asked him, I said, Ted, do you remember when you told me about being in the swamps and how that you went through the horrible time? It scared you. He said, yeah. He said, remember that promise you made to God? She would always thank him and praise him for that. He said, yeah. He said, I haven't done it. 
I haven't done it. He said, he brought me back to Vietnam and kept me safe. And he says, I haven't done it. I said, Ted, get back to God. Get back to God before it's too late. Now, I end with this. Either you can lay hands in the wilderness of somebody that's sick beside you with a problem and see God heal them, or you can get in the same way they are and you can die of thirst and hunger and sickness. You can find that pit and lay in it and what? Or you can get out of it and make something out of ourselves a lot better. Remember this. The wilderness isn't going to move. You're going to move. It's always going to be there, and everybody's going to have to go through it. Some of us, older folks, maybe have been through our wildernesses. We might have to face some harder things yet. I don't know. But most of the real hard things in the early part of my ministry, I've never experienced. Me and Rose, I've never experienced those again. Life has been pretty good to us. We still have a lot of heavy burdens because we're a pastor. And we have a lot of things to look after. And I'm happy to do that. Happy to do that. I'm your shepherd. You're under shepherd. But let me tell you something, folks. Some of you tonight are in that wilderness. And you're not out of it yet. You're not out of it yet. Some of you are just ready to start into it. Have you counted the cost? Have you counted the cost? Are you serious enough about God that you're not going to listen to a lot of foolery and a lot of stuff that is worthless and doesn't amount to a hill of beans so that you can serve God without being intimidated by this world? That's what it's going to have to be if we get through this world. Am I right, folks?